Is that Ryan Gosling? Nope. Just your new favorite stats tutor. So today I, I really want to try to tackle demystifying statistics. And I know it's a, a big task, uh, but I really think that statistics is very poorly taught in school. Uh, there's a huge gap between the, the very small set of old parametric models that we learn and what we actually do in practice with statistics. Uh, rarely is the actual philosophy of statistics taught, you know, the, the thinking about what you're doing. And statistics, after all, is thinking with data. It's not just the application of probability. So what I want to do today is try to, to close the gap between what you learn and what we do by going into a bit of the philosophy behind stats. So this little video, this little course, will assume you have some basic exposure to statistics, um, but that you're still a little bit confused about how it all works. And by the end of it, I hope to have taken what you know, organized all of that into a nice, neat little box, and then we'll close that box, put it away, and never open it again. So I think traditionally in statistics courses, and I've taken about three intro to statistics courses, uh, the emphasis is on techniques and procedures. You probably are familiar with a decision tree like this, where it provides almost a recipe for how to perform a statistical test based on you know, your type of data and uh, what the sampling design was and what you're trying to, what exactly you're trying to, to accomplish. Um, I think the reality of this though is that it, it kind of teaches the recipe without teaching what's going on behind the scenes. And as maybe as an analogy, I played an instrument for many years when I was a youngster. Um, I could read sheet music, I knew where the notes were, but it went, when it came to improvising, I had no idea the theory behind music and scales and that kind of thing. I'd memorize them, but I didn't know the first thing about music. And so I, I wouldn't really consider myself a musician, even though I could, I could read the notes and, and play the, the songs. Uh, and in the very same way, you know, understanding one of these decision trees is not statistics. And I think that lack of engagement with what's going on underneath all of this is what deters a lot of students from statistics and, and creates those situations where you need to do some kind of stats in your, in your study and students go, oh no, not stats. And so um, what I wanna show really is that, you know, we learn all of these complicated tests and routines for specific types of data and situations, but actually underneath it all, they all work the exact same way. So ultimately, in statistical inference, we are concerned with the strength of a signal, given any kind of noise, and deducing the properties of some underlying distribution or set of distributions, assuming that uh, the data that we have is a sample from a larger population that is represented by a well-known statistical distribution. So, we're, we're interested in, in what is the strength of a pattern, given the, the size, the magnitude of that pattern, any noise present in that pattern, and then the amount of data that we have, and is this pattern strong enough to believe, provided or, or given the, the assumptions and the underlying distribution of that data generating process. So I think to start, we will start with probability distributions because this is really what underlies everything in statistics, or at least our ability to make inference with statistics. So let's pretend that we've collected some data on the sepal width of iris flower. So this is that very famous iris data set. And I've got some code here in R that we can use to kind of demonstrate this study. I think throughout this video, I'll have a few examples of some R code uh, that hopefully will allow you to apply some of this and learn and maybe better see what's actually happening. So these measurements are a continuous measurement of width. They're rounded to the nearest decimal. And you can see here all of those measurements. It looks like there's about 150 of them. And then 
We can also view this as a contingency table of counts for each measurement. So this table command returns that contingency table and shows the frequency of each measurement that we've made. And we can see that some of these are only one measurement, some we have about 10 measurements at that value, some 26, and so on. Uh, and this really is a, a distribution of our data. And it might help, perhaps, to, to view this more intuitively, although entirely unnecessary for an actual uh, analysis. But intuitively, it might help to view this as kind of a tally chart. So I've recreated this in R with a little bit of code. Uh, but just visually, you can see the measurements and then how frequently each of those measurements was observed in a tally. And if we flip this on its side, we have a histogram. So this histogram of sepal width shows still the frequency of each observation. And this is kind of at the core of, of what statistics is about. It's about thinking with probability. And here we sort of have a representation of the probability of a given measurement. Um, if in this histogram code we change the frequency argument to false, then we can visualize the densities of observations rather than the frequency. So now the, the area under the curve, so to speak, sums to one. And in addition to this, I've overlaid in red the probability density function for a normal distribution with a mean of 3.06 and a standard deviation of 0 0.44. So this is a normal distribution. Informally, we call this a bell curve. And from your previous introduction to stats, you'll probably know that very often we're looking to see if our data is normally distributed. So we want to see how well does this bell curve fit our data. The normal distribution pops up all over statistics because it is a fairly convenient distribution. It has two parameters, the mean and the standard deviation, and the shape of that curve, that red line, the probabilities, is entirely defined by just those two parameters. And we can see here that the distribution of our sepal width measurements are fairly close to a normal distribution. And in practice, there are many distributions that reflect different sampling designs, different study designs, different types of data. Um, I think, though, covering all of these is kind of going down the path of memorizing routines for specific cases. So just understand that there are many families of distributions, and incorporating these distributions into our underlying probability models makes for very flexible models. And that's going to be the, the thread that I hope ties all of this together for you. Um, there's a couple distributions here, the normal, the T distribution, the F distribution, then I've got binomial and geometric, hypergeometric, uniform, Poisson, and exponential. So let's have a look then more at that normal distribution. I mentioned that it's a mathematically convenient distribution. It's also convenient in an applied way because many natural phenomena actually, or uh, many natural phenomena have distributions very close to the normal distribution. So take height, for instance. Height is very often normally distributed in nature. Uh, measurement error is also very often normally distributed. Uh, and these nice mathematical properties and nice reflection of what we see biologically make it quite useful. And in many practical cases, the methods that are developed using normal theory, they work quite well, even if our true population distribution is not perfectly normal. So the normal distribution has support over all of the real numbers, so it is a continuous distribution. It has a mean mu, which is also uh, supported over all of the real numbers, and it is a variance of sigma squared, which is a value greater than zero. Those two, the mean and the variance, or the standard deviation, those are the parameters of the normal distribution. And then here I have the density function, which defines this curve, but we don't really need to go too much into that. I'm, I, I want to avoid kind of focusing on 
formula and mathematics today and just look at how this applies. I think the takeaway here is you can see those two parameters are really the only variables in this function and so they entirely define that whole density. And so the normal distribution can have many different shapes depending on these two parameters mu and sigma. And I've got a couple examples here. We can shift the mean over to the left to negative two, that's the green one, or we can change the variance of the standard deviation of our normal distribution and get some of those kind of fatter bell curves. The standard distribution, standard normal distribution though, is a special case where the mean is zero and the standard deviation is one, that's this red one. And in practice, we could standardize any variable to the standard normal distribution by subtracting the mean from each value and dividing by the standard deviation. So this kind of standardizes x um, to give a statistic with units of standard deviation and brings it onto a common scale, sort of. So the distribution of, of z will then have a mean of 0 and a standard deviation of 1. And that will tell us how many standard deviation units our x is away from the mean, or kind of the probability that a, a normally distributed variable x with a known mean and a known standard deviation comes from a particular set. Um, it's also kind of a way to, a standardized way to compare distributions or normal distributions. So let's say we wanted to test if a sample mean had a value specified in a null hypothesis. We'd start by looking back at the standard normal distribution. Standardizing a normally distributed variable with the equation above tells us how many standard deviations a value is from the population mean. We call this a z-score. We can conveniently use this to determine the probability of a sample mean being generated by the null or the population distribution, provided that we know the population standard deviations um, or the variance here. So we would standardize our test statistic, the mean. We're just using that function introduced before, but we're now working with a, a lowercase x bar. This is the mean of our samples to give a z statistic. So we divide by, uh, we divide sigma by square root n now because we're working with a statistic from a sampling distribution and we need to scale it so that it sums to one. So this z statistic or this z score has the standard normal distribution and tells us how many standard deviations our sample mean is from the population mean. And we know from the normal distribution that about 68% of the observations fall within one standard deviation of the mean, and we know that about 95% of the observations fall within two standard deviations of the mean. So from here we could kind of deduce the probability of our observation arising from this particular distribution with mean mu and standard deviation sigma. So in practice we would, we would get a value that would be somewhere along this x-axis, and then we could see there how far away from that value that mean our particular value it is our particular value is and this gives us a way of testing whether that value actually came from the distribution and that's sort of what's at the heart of of all of these statistical tests and intuitively we have actually created a statistical test this is the z test without even knowing it we've kind of arrived at that and so Remember that statistical inference is based on determining the strength of some signal and testing that signal to determine its believability. We do this with a test statistic. The one we just saw, the z-score, is a test statistic. Most of them have this general form. We have some numerator that is a signal maybe sensitive to an alternative hypothesis. That is, its magnitude tends to be larger when the alternative hypothesis is true. And the denominator is some kind of scaling parameter that allows the distribution of the test statistic to be determined. So in this case, the general form is sort of the, the sample statistic, often a mean, subtracted by some null parameter, and then divided by the standard error to scale that. 
It's a ratio, and it's often a ratio of signal to noise. And an important property of a test statistic is that the sampling distribution under that null hypothesis must be calculable, either exactly or approximately, and then from there we can uh, calculate p-values and that kind of thing, determine significance. So without really having covered it, we've actually already introduced the concept of a sampling distribution. The central limit theorem establishes that the distribution of sample means, so thinking back to that z-score, um, the distribution of sample means from any distribution is approximately normally distributed. We call this the sampling distribution of the sample means. So let's look at this in practice. We have here a population of little crabs or crabs of varying sizes. And from that population, we take samples. And the sampling distribution is the distribution of means in each of those independent sample draws. So remember that a parameter refers to a characteristic of a population under study, and a statistic refers to a particular sample from that population. Sample statistics estimate the parameters of a population, and those sample statistics have their own theoretical distributions. They don't really exist, but if we were to sample repeatedly over and over again, then that sampling distribution would reflect uh, our statistic. So from the central limit theorem, the sampling distribution of the mean sampled from any distribution is approximately normal, and we can kind of visualize this in R. So here we are doing 1,000 samples, or sorry, 1,000, yeah, 1,000 samples of a sample size of 30 from a uniform distribution. So R unif is the function that creates a random number from a uniform distribution. Here, minimum zero, maximum one, but we could use any of the probability distribution function functions there. And we would see that the sampling distribution of the mean would have this approximately normal shape, this bell curve. And as an aside, the standard error, a term you are probably familiar with, that is simply the standard deviation of the sampling distribution of the mean. And it has this formula here, sigma divided by, divided by square root of n. So unfortunately, there is no handy equivalent of the central limit theorem for the sampling distribution of the sample variance. But it can be shown that if z are sampled from a normal distribution, then the quantity n minus 1 s squared divided by sigma squared. So s squared here is our sample variance. Um, that has a chi-square distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. What's a chi-squared distribution? <laughs> well, this is a new distribution that I'm introducing here, new to you. And chi-squared distributed variables with k de free, degrees of freedom arise from the sum of k-squared independent standard normally distributed random variables. You've probably heard the term sum of squares before. It's probably familiar to you. It's going to appear often, and it is kind of important in bringing all of this together. Um, this, so let's, let's kind of define the chi-squared distribution. If we sample from a normal distributed vari variable and then square that value and then sample from a normal, another normal distribution and square that value, the sum of those two values would be a chi-squared distributed value with two degrees of freedom. So depending on how many times you sample, that defines your degrees of freedom. And in practice, this defines a distribution where with low degrees of freedom, you're more likely to have small values. So think about sampling from the standard normal. The bulk of that distribution is centered around zero. So if we sample just once, we're probably pretty likely to get a value of zero, and then we square that. If we sample twice, maybe we're a little bit more likely to get a larger value. <clears throat> so as the degrees of freedom increase, the tail of that distribution increases, allowing for larger numbers, but still with relative um, 
low probability. So this value here, this n minus 1 times s squared divided by sigma squared is the chi-squared statistic. And why is this important? Well, in practice, uh, when, we, when we try to use something like the z-score, we don't actually often know the variance of our population, that sigma parameter. And so we estimate it using our sample, which means we're estimating it from a sampling distribution. And so that sampling distribution will have a chi-square distribution. The sampling distribution of the sample variance, S squared, is approximately normal for very large sampling sizes. So this allows us to link um, those assumptions back to a statistical test. So we, we know that big enough sample sizes, the variance, the distribution of the variance is chi-squared distributed, but approach is normal. The issue, though, is that when we're sampling from a non-normal distribution, the variance of the sampling distribution of the variance, of sample variance, can be much less or much greater than when sampling from a normal distribution. And then inference procedures for the variance, sigma squared, that are based on the assumption of normality can work very poorly when that's violated. So that's why the, you know, we always make a big fuss about the distribution uh, being normal or the assumption of normality when we're doing some of this hypothesis testing. Uh, but I think I'm kind of veering off course here and getting a little bit, maybe confusing you guys a little bit. So let's revisit then the z-score. I mentioned that uh, we use this to determine the probability that our sample mean arises from a distribution with the same or with, with a mean mu and variance sigma. But in practice, as I mentioned before, we don't often know the population standard deviation of variance. And so we estimate it from the sample standard deviation, which, as we've seen before, is a statistic. And so it has its own sampling distribution that's going to vary with sample size. And so we replace then that sigma with s, the sample standard deviation, and that changes the underlying distribution of this z-score, which we're now calling a t-statistic or a t-score. So it no longer has, t no longer has the standard normal distribution. It now has a t-distribution. So we know that when sampling from a normal distribution, the sample distribution of the sample variance has the chi-squared distribution with n minus one degrees of freedom. So in practice, what we're doing when we replace sigma with s, our sample standard deviation, is we're creating a statistic that is in the numerator a normally distributed test, a normally distributed statistic, and in the denominator a statistic or a variable that follows a chi-squared distribu distribution. Um, and as it turns out, the t distribution is exactly that. It is a ratio of a normal to a chi-square. And what this looks like is sort of an approximation of the normal distribution, but with fatter tails. So here in red, I have the standard normal distribution. And then in black, I have a t distribution with one degree of freedom. And it has roughly the same shape, but you can see those tails. There's more mass in those tails. And this kind of makes sense in practice because we're estimating a parameter with a statistic, and so there will be greater variability in the distribution of that statistic. So we have wider tails. So this distribution here, with this form, as sample size increases, or as the degrees of freedom approach infinity, the t-distribution then will start to approach the standard normal. We can see that as we increase here the parameter v, the degrees of freedom. So here's v equals 2 and so on, and as we get bigger and bigger, we are approaching the standard normal. So ultimately, we've created a very well-defined statistical distribution that reflects a real-world sampling design, um, in that our uncertainty in the variance of our sample decreases with more samples. And that's sort of, I mean, that is the t-test, but that's at the core of, of this statistical testing. Um, we're, we're basically, you know, the ANOVA, the, all the other 
tests that we do in practice do the same thing. When we go then to make inference from that distribution, we're looking at how our test statistic falls along the distribution of the null hypothesis. So a t-distribution arises when sampling a mean from a normally distributed population where the population standard deviation is not known and the sample size is small. And like a standard normal distribution, the t-distribution really is just an underlying statistical estimate of the probability of finding data at different distances from the mean relative to the sample standard deviation. That distance is called the t-statistic, and that's what we're calculating here. And it allows us to make our frequentist inference with the null distribution or the hypothesis using that t-test. So here I've kind of illustrated when we're doing a t-test and we're, if we're interested in whether our value is greater than a given mean, you know, we would be looking at where our test statistic falls along that x-axis and then we want to know what is the likelihood or the probability that we get a value greater than that and that p-value is then the or maybe I won't talk about p-value just yet the, the critical t-value at which we would reject the null hypothesis that there is no difference would be the t-value corresponding to a particular threshold for acceptance usually alpha of 0 0.05 so that where that red area starts would be that critical area and the threshold would be what the t value is on the x-axis there for a particular t distribution of in this case we have two degrees of freedom um, sometimes you're simply interested in whether a given value is simply different not whether it's greater or less than and so you're looking at kind of the 5% that are in either end of those two tails, so 2.5 on one, 2.5 on the other. Um, and consequently, this is also sort of how we would develop a confidence interval for a population mean. So our mean value is going to be distributed around 0 here. And depending on the degrees of freedom of the underlying t distribution, the, the confidence interval of the mean would be the mean plus or minus whatever the corresponding t value is for the, that threshold multiplied by the standard error of our sampling mean. Um, and then the p value, and using an example of here testing whether maybe a given mean our, t, our, our sample mean is less than a given mean. Here the p-value would correspond to the area under the curve either above or in this case below our test statistic. So in R we can calculate this using the, for the t-distribution, the p-t function. But the p-family of functions for all of the distributions calculates that area under the curve. Um, and this is kind of the basis for, for frequentist statistical inference. Uh, but there are many other paradigms for statistical inference. We could be doing Bayesian inference, likelihood-based inference, or information criterion-based informa uh, inference, AIC inference. Um, and so I hope I've kind of started to <laughs> unravel. As I, I say this, I, I worry that I'm maybe even just making it more confusing. Let's talk a little bit about assumptions. I think that's an important thing to cover. Now, there are many different types of assumptions that we could make that might find their way into our statistical tests, and they generally fall under a couple of categories. You have model-based assumptions, or you have design-based assumptions. Design-based assumptions being those that relate to the way that observations were gathered. Um, you know, is your sampling design random? Those kinds of things. Model-based assumptions, are going to refer to the underlying probability distribution or, or st structural assumptions that you're making when you're testing a hypothesis. And so you might have distributional assumptions, so where a model involves terms relating to random errors, you might make assumptions about the probability distribution of those errors.
So, and often, oftentimes we're assuming that those errors are normally distributed. You might also be making structural assumptions. The statistical relationships between variables are, are related by models that equate one variable to another or several others plus some random error. And the structural assumption might be that they are related in a linear way or they can be generalized to involve um, kind of more uh, different types of relationships. And those are the types of assumptions that we make. And so I think what I want you to understand is that the, the assumptions that follow from statistical tests, they, they're not just, you know, they don't arrive out of nowhere. They, they have some relationship to what's going on under the hood. Um, in the t-test, the assumptions are often that the, the mean follows a normal distribution with a, a mean, the sample mean follows a normal distribution with a mean mu and a variance of s squared over n. And that s squared over n follows a chi-squared distribution with n minus 1 degrees of freedom. And that the value x bar minus mu and s over square root n are independent of one another. There are other assumptions that we add to the, these when we, when we do a two-sample t-test. Um, but we don't really need to get too much into that. I think the big picture, the thing that I want you to, to take away from all of this is that it's the distributions that tie all of this together. Modeling ultimately is estimating some data generating distribution or set of, of distributions and then making inferences based on the corresponding parameters of those distributions. I tried to find a, a histogram here of stacked Benjamins, but this is the best I can do, but it's all about the distributions. So let's build on this then. Um, we've got t-tests that we've covered. We introduced the chi-squared distribution and we did see a chi-squared test statistic. Um, and then we can also look at the ANOVA. So the different variants of the t-test, they relax some of the underlying assumptions that we just introduced by modifying, modifying the scaling factor in the test statistic. So modifying the denominator there, um, the standard error and the variance, and correspondingly adjusting the degrees of freedom of the underlying distributions of those test statistics. So start of, we're kind of starting to partition variance amongst groups and modify our degrees of freedom according to that. A chi-squared goodness of fit test, um, the test statistic for that is simply the observed value minus the expected value squared divided by the expected value with the degrees of freedom corresponding to the number of categories minus one. And what I hope you see is that it has that same, the test statistic has that same sort of general shape. We have some test statistic minus a null parameter divided by a scaling term here. Um, so in the chi-squared test, at least in the chi-squared goodness of fit test, we would be comparing some theoretical frequency of observation. So whether they are equally distributed between groups or unequally distributed between groups. Or we might be interested in testing if observations belong to a given family of distributions. Um, and then our theoretical frequencies would be calculated from some distribution in that family. And then, um, that, well, that's the equation here with P. Um, P are basically one plus the number of parameters for the distribution. And then the degrees of freedom would be the number of categories minus P. So the chi-squared distribution, remember that it is a distribution where large values are not as probable. So basically the larger the difference in observed versus expected, the less likely that an observation follows the null distribution, that there is no difference. We can also use the chi-squared test to test for independence of observations in a contingency table. I won't really go into this, but it basically expands the chi-squared test to two dimensions. And remember your ANOVA tables? Well, the F statistic that you calculate from those tables, the mean sum of squares between groups divided by the mean sum of squares within groups,
um, that also has our basic test statistic form. We have some kind of value that we are interested in determining how far away it is from a null distribution, and we're scaling it. The F statistic, the underlying distribution of the, the F statistic, follows an F distribution with degrees of freedom um, that has two values for its sort of degrees of freedom parameters. It has df1, which is equal to k, the number of groups minus 1, and degrees of freedom 2, and minus k, which is the number of observations minus the number of groups. And an F distribution is just the ratio of two chi-squared distributions. So we have basically the, um, the within group variability, sorry, the between group variability, which is a sampling distribution of variance divided by the within group variability, which is also a sampling distribution of variance. So remember sampling distributions of variance when the observation is normally distributed have chi-squared distributions. So here we have two, the ratio of two chi-squared distributions and that is the F distribution. <clears throat> when, um, yeah, and when there are only two groups, the F statistic simplifies to the T statistic. So we began with the normal distribution and the T distribution, um, but really it's, it's kind of the chi-squared distribution that ties this all together because ultimately we're interested in, in the sampling distribution of sampling variance, and I think that kind of comes together in the name of the ANOVA test, the analysis of variance. Uh, I hope by now that you're, you're starting to organize all of the stuff that you've previously learned and, and organize some of those um, concepts from your Intro to Stats course and, and starting to put together a pretty clear picture in your mind of how this, how this all works. For me, it wasn't really until thinking about regression that, that all of this kind of clicked. So I think that's a good place to end this all off. And, and um, hopefully, you know, some of those light bulbs will start to trigger. So I assume that you're familiar with the basic concepts of linear regression. That is your basic, you know, your y equals mx plus b. Um, I've got a different form of that here, but your b is your beta zero, and then your mx is going to be your b is your, your slope, your intercept, sorry, b is your intercept, your slope then is your m, or your, your beta one here, and we could have various uh, a number of parameters all with corresponding slopes that relate some value, a predictor value, to a response value. And so in regression then, we have a bunch of observations, and we're trying to find this line of best fit that minimizes the distance from each observation to that line of best fit. And that's exactly what ordinary least squares does. We are trying to find the value that minimizes the square difference of these residuals. So the square difference between some observed value and an expected value that is predicted by a linear function. And where these residuals are normally distributed, the ordinary least squares estimator that fits this line corresponds to the maximum likelihood estimator. Now the ANOVA is simply a special case of regression in which the predictor variables are categorical. Um, so they're basically the same thing, though they kind of have different uses. The, the ANOVA would be a tool to check how much the residual variance is reduced by the predictors in a regression model. And a regression analysis would aim to quantify the effect size in terms of how much a response is expected to change when the predictors change. That's the difference, but at their core, they're basically the same thing. And I think we can see this by, by running both. So here in R, I've got an analysis of variance on... Oh, what I don't show you here is me adding the data set, the MTCARS data set, but maybe we've added it already, I just didn't notice. But you'll need that data set. And here I'm running an analysis of variance on um, the, the fuel consumption 
of each of these cars grouped by the number of cylinders that they have. And I've done this with the AOV function. And then I do the same thing, but with a linear model using the LM function. So here we're trying to predict the fuel efficiency of a car based on the number of cylinders. And you'll see when we run the analysis of variance, we get our normal t, uh, sorry, our normal table here, sum of squares table. We have the sum of squares due to the within groups and then the sum of squares due to the between groups, the degrees of freedom for each. And then from the linear model, if I look at the sum of the squared residuals or the deviance of that model, you'll see that it is basically this, this between group um, sum of squared value from our ANOVA table. And that's the relationship between the two. Um, so another way of, of looking at this relationship maybe is to look at the similarity, similarities between the F, or at least how the F statistic and the R squared values are derived. So the F statistic is simply the explained variance divided by the unexplained variance. Um, we've got the F value here, it looks like 39.7 displayed from our ANOVA summary. Um, and you'll be able to calculate that directly using the sum of squares values. We've also got in our linear model the R squared presented down here. It is multiple R squared is 0 0.7325. We can derive that same value from our sum of squares table. So it's 1 minus the, um, the residual sum of squares divided by the basically the total sum of squares. <clears throat> and then also what we're presented with here in our linear model are p-values. These are kind of equivalent to if you were to then do a post hoc test like a Tucky's HSD. But you know, I think Without going too much into the mathematics of it, I, I, I hope that this is starting to kind of illuminate some of the links between these two. Um, and then I think a nice way to so start wrapping things up um, is to just show the extension of the, the regression, the ordinary least squares re regression um, with generalized linear models. So these then extend the relationship between the, the random and the systematic components of a model in a linear regression. That is the independent and dependent, or the response and the predictor. Um, they extend these to the entire family of exponential distributions through a link function. So here I've got a table that shows you those, uh, the random component, so the response, and the systematic component, the predictor, and then the function that we use to link those um, here we could maybe show the example of a logistic regression where instead of predicting a continuous variable, we are predicting a binomial variable and we can have continuous or categorical systematic components and those are linked using the logit function. We also have additive models that relax the, the linear or the parametric assumption of a regression by modeling the predictor, so modeling the the systematic component as themselves function of some additive combination of, of nonlinear functions. And then there are mixed models which contain both fixed effects, so our systematic components, and random effects. Um, so think of it kind of as extra error terms that either nest or partition the variance further. So kind of modeling both variance between and within categories. I don't really want to get too deep into, into the, the extensions of modeling because that's a whole field in and of itself. But I think there is one last thing that's important to cover uh, before we wrap things up, and those are non-parametric tests and resampling techniques. So these are methods that we can use for cases when our data, when our data don't necessarily come from a normal distribution. Um, so, these non-parametric statistical tests function similar to the parametric counterparts, but the statistic is not based on an underlying distribution, or the underlying distribution is not described uh, 
by a finite number of parameters. So briefly, we could consider the, the Man Whitney U test statistic or the Kruskal Wallace H test statistic. Um, these are analogous to your T test and your ANOVA, um, but rather than comparing means, they compare the mean rank of the data. And if we assume that the shape of the population distributions are the same, then this basically becomes a test of medians. And if the distributions are identical, then a test of medians is basically a test of the means. And that's kind of the link back to, to the concepts that we learned before. But remember, they're non-parametric, so we don't have that, we don't know the, the true shape of the distribution. So because we don't tie these tests back to specific kind of well-defined distributions, the assumptions are fewer. Um, but we also then lose statistical power. Um, resampling then describes a number of techniques that can also be used to estimate the underlying distribution from the data for statistical inference. So if we are interested in estimating the precision of a sample statistic, for instance, we could use a jackknife approach and that basically leaves one observation out of our sample we calculate the variance based on that. Um, bootstrapping is kind of similar to this where we draw randomly from our sample with replacement and sort of reconstruct the underlying probability distribution over numerous samples from our, from our sample. The, a bootstrap and a jackknife technique, they, these can be used to estimate the variability of a statistic between subsamples rather than using those parametric assumptions. Um, a permutation test similarly allows us to obtain the null distribution by exchanging labels on data points when we're doing significance tests. So if we have a bunch of observations that correspond to different categories, we would simply relabel those and look at the distribution there as our null distribution. And so we're if if the process was to occur randomly, then the labels wouldn't really matter, right? Um, and then the last example here, cross-validation. This is uh, where you would split your data up into two halves, two parts, and you would have a training data set and a testing data set. So you fit your statistical model to, to one data set, and then you use it to predict the other data set and see how well it performs. And so these are just some other methods that relax those parametric assumptions but allow us to still model and, and perform statistical analysis. All right, so I hope that was, that was useful in clearing up some of these ideas. And if you like this video, please give us a, a follow and a subscribe. Check out our other social media channels. We're going to keep doing this. If there are any videos that you'd like to see, we'll try to make them. We'll try to make shorter ones so that um, you don't have to sit here as long. But thanks for watching, and I look forward to talking to you guys again soon. See ya!